there are times when I read the scriptures and I find them helpful. There are other times when I read the scriptures where I'm not at all sure what the meaning of the text is. And I have to go look it up and I have to say, wait a second, I don't get exactly what's going on. So I have to study and learn. Then there are other times where I actually do get what the scripture is talking about, but I don't want to face it. And because that happens, then I can say, well, you know, I'm not exactly sure what this means. But what's really going on is that in my heart of hearts, I know precisely what it means. But I don't want to face the implications in terms of what it actually might mean for my life as one who has said, I believe in the scriptures, I believe they're God's word, and my job is to follow them. I want to tell you that this morning, these lessons are precisely in that third category. It's not that I don't know. I know all too well. And what it does, in a very uncomfortable way, is show like a mirror what's going on in my own heart, which is in fact one of the roles the scripture plays, is that it's supposed to illumine what's inside of us, and as a result, show us, but then invite us into a better way, into a deeper way that actually changes our hearts for the better. But you see, a part of what I wrestle with is that when I get especially into those times of prayer, or I, I'm with my fellow Christians, what I really want to do is put my best foot forward. I don't want, to, I don't want all that's in my heart revealed. Because there are things that are going on that are not so good that, quite frankly, I wish weren't there at all. And so I live in this kind of interior sense of denial. You know, as long as I don't think about them, maybe they'll just go away. Isn't that true for you? Nod your head. You get, you get this. And so what happens is when I'm in that place and I read scripture like these, I go, oh, I can't, I can't act like it's not there. Because what Jesus is talking about, and what James is talking about, and they really are sort of two sides of the same coin, is a call to, in essence, living for God's approval, but nobody else's. That's really what he's describing. It, it shows up in the Gospel reading because... Jesus is trying to teach his disciples something that they don't naturally know. What they assume is, is that the Messiah is going to come, the Son of Man, and he's going to ride in on a white steed. He is going to come and kill all of his enemies. He is going to set Israel free from their Roman oppressors and in essence establish the kingdom, kingdom of God on earth. And what Jesus has been trying to teach his disciples for actually... Several sections of the Gospel of Mark. Remember, it was not all that long ago where Jesus tried to say this and Jesus interrupted him and said, absolutely not. And Jesus had to say to him, get behind me, Satan. Tough words. Only time that's ever happened. And here we are now in the middle of a chapter and a half later, and he's still in the same mode. This is so important that Jesus wants to make sure that his disciples understand this. So as the gospel picks up this morning, it says that Jesus and his disciples are in Galilee. They've got a lot of friends in Galilee, but the fact of the matter is he doesn't want to make any public appearances. In fact, he keeps his disciples and him out of the public eye. They're meeting in secret. Why? Because he is teaching his disciples, the scripture says. He wants them to get this. This is incredibly important. The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days, three days later, after being killed, he will rise again. But it says, they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. You see, if Jesus was going to be coming in on a big white steed, and kill his enemies. Well, there's hardly a man alive who doesn't want to be a war hero. And that's what they would have been, because they would have been right there with him, sword in hand, slaying the wicked, honored with medals and accolades after the war is over, taking an exalted position with Jesus as, 
lieutenants and captains in the midst of an army that's literally a overthrown the very empire of Rome. Who has done that? No one up to that point. So when Jesus says, it's not going to happen, you mean you're not going to overthrow Caesar after all? You're not going to get rid of Herod? No, he had, Jesus is saying, what's going to happen is that I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be killed. Oh, that means that could happen to us too. Nobody considers that a very exciting and wonderful message. And because they have literally no room inside of them to receive what Jesus is trying to say, even though he's getting, he's going after this again and again and again, if you read this, the rhythm that the scripture lays out, they have no room to hear and he will rise again. They have no category for that whatsoever. So, sure, they don't understand. But you see, a part of the reason they don't want to understand is not because Jesus is speaking, not speaking plainly. He's speaking very plainly. It's just that there's no room inside of them to receive what it is that Jesus is teaching. They don't want to face the implications. Now, I have to confess to you, as I read the Gospel lesson and the James lesson, there's a part of me who doesn't want to understand. Do you see the, the pattern? You see, if, if, I, if I can somehow keep the implications of the scripture down here someplace, not rise to the level of rationale and getting the point, then I can sort of think, well, I'm off the hook. I don't have to do this. I don't even understand what it means that I can blithely walk away. Ignorance is bliss. God isn't going to hold me accountable for what I don't know, is he? And so I can just go ahead and live my life. No, 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 no. You see, what the disciples do here is often what we do as it relates to the scriptures that we don't like, don't want to face, don't want to wrestle with the implications of in terms of our lives, as people have already said by, very, by baptism and even their presence here that we're followers of Jesus. We, in fact, have already said to him, we want to do what you say we should do. Because in some ways, the very same disconnect between their expectations of what a Messiah would be and our expectations of what a Christian should be run along parallel lines. You see, what we want from Jesus is that we want Jesus to keep our family safe, protect us from harm, bless our good efforts, make sure that we get noticed and thanked when we do something well, and be in that position of being admired. Even if we're not particularly comfortable with the limelight, there is still a part of us that really wants to be thanked when we do something well. After all, one of the, one of the requirements of our culture is that when somebody does something nice, we write them a thank you note, right? Not your head. And not to do that means that you've really abrogated a social responsibility. And so we do these things like if we send a gift and we don't get a note, we call someone and we say, did it get lost in the mail? <laughs> and it's both a concern to make sure that they got the gift, but we really do want to be thanked <laughs> for what it is that we have done. And both Jesus and echoed in the epistle, James what most likely was Jesus' brother, speak two sides of the same coin and talk about servanthood. A servanthood that actually spends time not with those who will get you in the limelight, but with the least. And to help facing the fact that this desire to be ambitious and to get ahead and to get what we want, man, it's the source of an extraordinary amount of trouble. And it is, in fact, something to be powerfully resisted, James says. That's why Jesus takes a child and holds him and says, you need to welcome people just like you welcome one of these kids. Now, we need to hear it in their context. In our context, we would say, of course, we adore our children in a lot of ways, and rightfully so. 
I, my wife and I have five sons, and all of us could talk for a long time about our children, as I'm sure could you or your grandchildren. We love our kids, most of us. Most of the time. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. But in that culture, there was something else going on. In that culture, until you were old enough, in fact, to make a difference in the life of your family, whether it was to, if you were a, old, that means old enough to do chores, maybe to find your place in the family business, to, in essence, contribute to the welfare of the household, you were kind of a nuisance to be put up with. You didn't have a lot of value. And so when Jesus picks up a child, someone who is not old enough to contribute, someone who in fact is still just needing a heck of a lot of attention, attention that in fact takes me away from trying to do the things that I need to do in terms of work and keeping the house in order so that our family can survive. Because you're talking about a people who by and large lived absolutely on the monetary edge. They were not in comfortable retirement or anything close to it. They did not have a working job. Many of them living under the oppression of Rome had, I mean, they could have their goods confiscated by a Roman soldier at any moment, and they had no recourse. These were people who, by virtue of really severe political oppression, lived in economic poverty. So when you had a child, it was like, okay, thank you, God, for this gift, but how am I going to feed this extra mouth? And what am I going to do for the next seven or eight years until this child is old enough to actually do things around the house so we can do more to earn a living? You see, that's the way they thought about it. Yes, gift of God, but God, sometimes I'm not so happy with your gifts. And so when Jesus picks up a child in that culture... He's saying the one who needs the most attention, the one who can't contribute very much, the one who often gets in the messes, who doesn't know very much. If you welcome one of these, and we all know people who are like that, don't we? Nod your head, yes we do. <laughs> then he says, then you're welcoming me. In other words, he is calling on us to live in a level of servanthood that absolutely goes against the grain of ambition and building relationships to get you ahead and all of the things that our culture considers normal. I mean, if you read the letter of James and all of the stuff about fighting and ambition and things like that, that's the television show Survivor. It's Housewife of Beverly Hills. It's just about every reality TV show that's on television right now. People scheming, lying, doing manipulatively whatever they can to get they want. And that's our entertainment. So if that's in fact the case, James reads like a, a letter from a foreign land. Because he's saying those are not the characteristics to be applauded or cultivated, they are the very things that in fact invite evil into your life. For where there is jealousy and ambition, James writes, that's where there is every evil thing. And he even recognizes the fact that the source of those things is not only the sin in our hearts, but literally the very strategies of the devil himself, which is why when he comes to the end of the passage, one of his remedies is, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Submit yourself to God. These are not things to be applauded. They are to be absolutely kept at bay if we are going to cultivate the kind of heart that is willing to make room in our lives for the people who can do nothing good for us whatsoever. I got a tweet. Do you know what a tweet is? Twitter. I got a tweet not too long ago, and it was a quote saying, the true test of a person's character is what he does with people who have absolutely no benefit to him whatsoever. And that's absolutely right. More often than not, our social circles are surrounded, and we surround them by people who either make us look good, help us get ahead, provide some need, need or service in our lives, including the legitimate need of friendship. But very little do we make room for people who are like a child. They just get into messes and they always are needy and 
they require an extraordinary amount of time and we say things to them and they don't understand it all. They don't get it and we're thinking, what am I doing? Right? Servant. So, you can see why. When I read scripture like this, a part of me would love to go, oh, I don't get that one and then I sort of go, beyond my, go along my day. Because I don't want to face those implications. And what we need, you see, is for Jesus to come and to do something new in our hearts. We need God to literally reorient ourselves with a different focus. God, help me see people as you see them. Help me love them the way you love them. Because I just confess to you, Lord, that I'm drawn, attracted to, and really find easy to love people whom I like. But it's really hard to love people who not only do I not like, but sometimes are just nothing but a pain. Because you see, God has to do that. I, I can't change my affections. God has to do that work. But I am begging God to do that work because the last thing I want is for my affections to become an entryway for the attack of the devil. See, that's not very pretty, is it? So there's an urgency in this message, especially in a culture that applauds the very things that the scripture despises. But if we are to be men and women who reflect the very image of Christ, God has to do that work in our hearts. And it is not an easy work. But if we are willing to submit to it, the wonder is God really does begin to change our perspective. We do begin to see people differently. We can't make that happen to ourselves. And sometimes we give just out of sheer duty, not because we like it at all. But God will work in us. Because what he wants, what he wants is a congregation, holy apostles, satellite beach, to be a people who in their relationships look like him. And that's what the scriptures describe it today. A call that somehow our relationships would look like him. So can we do it? Absolutely not. Can he do it? Absolutely he can. Ask. Have the courage. Because this is this takes guts. Have the courage to ask. For God to change our hearts. To change our affections. That we might be the people that God wants us to be. So the holy apostles, Satellite Beach in their relationships, look more and more like Jesus. Let us pray. Lord, we do confess to you that this is something we'd rather not hear. We do confess to you, Lord, that it seems absolutely impossible to have happen. And so both the bankruptcy of our own faith as well as knowing ourselves as well as we do. Both drive us to say, oh Lord, you have to work this in us. We cannot do it. We're not even sure we want it. But Lord, if it's what you ask of us, if it's what you want to impart in us, and we've said we'll follow you, then Lord, do it, please. Make us more and more like you. May we be that body of people that in our love, our tenderness, our care, our relationships reflect you who do love us with a very deep and everlasting love. Each one of us just the same. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord that we pray. Amen. Amen.